All right, let's get started. So um, just a heads up on some logistics. First off, uh, priority registration or advanced registration has started today. And we had a very lively discussion at the beginning of class about what electives are being offered and whatnot. So it reminded me of something. So those of you who are eligible for capstone, um, you know because you got that automated email that told you you were either good or you needed to make sure that you were concurrently registering for whatever it said. Most of you were either good or you just needed to make sure that you were taking a design elective, which you were doing, probably going to be doing anyway, so uh, no big deal. But the big thing I wanted to mention is just make sure and keep that time slot open because we will register you for Capstone. You don't need to worry about it on your own. Uh, it might not happen today, might not happen for a week or so, but just make sure and keep that slot open. Do you have a question? Probably within the next week or so, um, uh, it goes to what I was saying. So I'm, I'm actually going to be out on Wednesday. I'm actually going to be out on Tuesday as well. So uh, it might be a little bit before I get to it because just so you're aware of my schedule, like we teach, and then I've got a, a high school recruiting event uh, later on, and then I'm hopping on a plane to Wichita. So it's going to be a busy day for, for, for me. So uh, it probably won't be until a little bit later that I can even uh, attack it. But if it hasn't happened in a week or so, I'll, I'll give you an update. Okay, um, so just so everybody's aware on logistics with the class, so exam two, uh, I'm still grading that. Uh, homework seven, uh, the TA is still working on that. Uh, you're going to get homework eight, which is the homework on development length, and you're not going to get that until Wednesday. That'll be due the following Wednesday. Um, it's probably one of the shorter assignments that we have in this course because I mean, I think after the, the past couple examples that we did, I think you kind of see what I mean. I mean, development length is, is quick. Um, the homework nine is, is a little bit beefier. It's on columns and bean columns. That's our last assignment. I'll give that to you when you turn in homework eight, and it'll be due uh, the Friday before finals week. So, sound good? All right. Depending upon where we get today, I might post a short little video on the playlist to sort of like make up for the lost time. But we're actually doing pretty good in terms of time here, so we might not necessarily need that day. We have a makeup day uh, during dead week, so if we really want to utilize that time, uh, we can. Okay. So with that, uh, let me let's let's get back into development length plan. Okay. So we, we started talking about the idea of development length, and we, uh, we started essentially you know, with, with the idea of why it's important. And, and I think it was a pretty straightforward process uh, to understand. The idea is you, know, you, have a, uh, you have a concrete placement that you're uh, performing, and you have some rebar that you'd like to develop. In other words, you want to be able to count on that rebar uh, achieving its full capacity. So the idea is how far do you embed that rebar uh, into the adjacent element. And so that's what the development length is. So, and remember, the ex like one of the simple examples that we utilized was if you have, let's say, a column, and you have a beam framing into that column, and that column is holding up you know, like a platform, a, a, you know, it's an elevated platform in a hotel, a dance floor, what have you. And so if this is a cantilevered beam, place the rebar up top. But then the idea is, well, how far does that rebar need to jut into the adjacent column so that it develops its full capacity? So this is the length that we're after, L sub D. Now L sub D is a really simple count once you have all the appropriate factors. Now what I have here on the board is I have the development length uh, equation for straight bars. So those are bars that have been undeformed. And then we have uh, the development length uh, equation for hooks that we're going to look at later. And there's a couple parameters that are uh, 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 that are common to both. So for instance, the psi E value uh, is present uh, in both equations. You see a Fy over lambda squared of Fc prime uh, in both equations. So uh, they're, they're very, very similar um, and they're very, very plug and chug. It, it's a pretty straightforward process. So um, we'll start off with the straight bar expression. So we had th uh, uh, three adjustment factors that we needed to account for. One was the top bar factor, so the idea that the bars on the top don't bond as well because you know, just, it's just a function of gravity. You're placing concrete, you get more air voids up top than you do on the bottom, so the bars up top don't uh, bond as well. So if you've got a top bar, any, a top bar is defined as any bar where this dimension uh, is 12 inches or greater. Uh, whenever that happens, we take uh, 
this value to be 1.3, otherwise it's 1.0. So keep in mind what that does to the equation and what that does to your development length. If you have a top bar that does not bond as well, you need a longer development length. If this value is 1.3 as opposed to 1, that makes the development length longer. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right, so that's the, uh, the top bar factor. Then we have the epoxy coating factor. Again, if you've uh, uh, placed concrete ever in an exterior application, or especially in applications where you have uh, significant corrosion issues, um, we say, all right, um, what, is, what does that do in terms of development length? Well, if you've ever handled epoxy coated rebar, it's slippery. It's slick. So slippery rebar isn't going to bond as well, and so slippery rebar is going to require a longer development length. So the idea is that, first off, if you're ever dealing with an uncoated bar where you don't have epoxy on it at all, then just take your psi value to be 1. But if you're dealing with epoxy coated bars, obviously you're going to up your development length, so your psi factor is going to be larger than 1. It's either uh, 1.2 uh, for just a generic situation, or if you have a situation where you have epoxy coated bar combined with very little uh, cover, in other words, uh, if the cover is less than three bar diameters or if the bar spacing is less than six bar diameters, you really got a problem there because not only do you have slippery bars, but you have slippery bars and you don't have much concrete around them. So you're definitely going to up your development length uh, a good bit. Size of S is your reinforcement. That's the size factor. So the idea is if you're using smaller bars, you tend to be using more of them. So while the bar size is smaller, you where, because you have more of them, you have a larger surface area. There's more surface area of the steel in contact with the concrete. So any time that you're using uh, bars that are number six or smaller, you actually get a perk. You get to lower your development length because you don't need as much uh, depth of penetration, but because there are smaller bars, there's more surface of steel in contact with the concrete. So it's a pretty straightforward uh, 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 determination. The last is this denominator. Now this denominator, I don't care what you calculate, it can't be larger than 2.5, so whatever you calculate here, uh, it's got to be less than that. Um, D sub B, that's pretty simple, that's just the bar diameter. The two new ones are this value and this value, so let's take them one at a time. C sub B, that's the smallest distance, if for any random bar, it's the smallest distance either to this edge, this edge, or halfway over to the next bar. Because remember, how, what does a concrete bar look like if you, are, if you grab that bar and yank on it? How does the concrete fail? Remember, it fails in that sort of cylindrical fashion that the, the cracks just sort of go like that. They sort of almost like a starburst from the bar just shoot out in that cylindrical fashion. So those cracks are going to stop either when they hit this edge, this edge, or hit halfway over here because this bar theoretically is going to be causing some cracking as well. So we just take the smaller of those values for C sub B. As for KTR, that's a transverse reinforcement index. So ba basically the idea is you know, you're, you're trying to figure out how far that bar needs to be embedded in the adjacent concrete. Well, if there's transverse reinforcement around that concrete, it's going to serve to sort of confine that concrete and provide that confining pressure uh, on, that, uh, on that core of concrete. So the idea is, you put stirrups, let's say, in a beam, that confines the beam, that keeps the concrete uh, together, so you actually get a perk on your uh, development length. If this value, this KTR value, goes, uh, you know, gets larger, it's going to ultimately decrease your entire, uh, uh, entire development length. And so we just take 40 times the transverse reinforcement, and so for beams, that's just AV. That's just the area of your shear reinforcement. Uh, S is the center-to-center -center spacing of that reinforcement, so that's just your stirrup spacing. And N is the largest number of bars in a single layer. So um, if we have three bars you know, along a single layer, that'd just be uh, three. OK. Uh, lastly, um, and this, this uh, check here on the bottom is actually going to apply to both, but we'll see that uh, probably here in a little bit. But whenever you're computing development length, one thing to keep in mind, this product right here has to be less than or equal to 1.7. And if you actually go through uh, and compute that and you find it's larger than 1.7, then what you would do is essentially replace this term with 1.7. So, so the idea is, is, remember, we're talking about very, very empirical relationships. So, you know, there's a trade-off between simplicity and accuracy. You know, we want the equations to be simple. We want them to be something that you could 
plug and chug or build a spreadsheet to calculate, you know, pretty straightforward, but at the same time we want them to be accurate. And so we have these really, really simple formulas for and really, really simple definitions for what these uh, factors are, but at the same time, we ha sometimes we have to impose some limits on them to ensure that they're representing what's, what's really going on with the, the data. You know, you go down to the lab and you start ripping a bunch of these specimens, well, you want to make sure that this equation, you know, works. Okay, uh, any questions on that so far? Okay. The last one, and we didn't really mess with this last time, but we are definitely going to mess with this today, uh, is a way that we can reduce our development length. And so to give you kind of an idea, let me go back to a, to a pretty basic example that we did really early on in the semester. So let's say you have a, a reinforced concrete beam. You know, you know this distance is B. You know this distance is D. And ultimately what you're trying to do is figure out you know, something like that, right? You, you're trying to figure out the steel, okay? This is a very, very common problem uh, in the earlier part of the class. And so, you know, you go through and do all the math and plug and chug, and you ended up getting somewhere, you know, to about this step. You know, you have an area of steel required, and it's a row BD. And, and let's say for the sake of discussion that you, I don't know, computed something like 3.7 square inches. Let, let's just say that's what you, you got, okay? And you say, all right, I have to choose a pattern of steel that's going to provide at least that much uh, area of steel. So say, all right, how about using four number nines? Anybody know what the actual area of four number nines is? Four. There we go. Yeah, number nine is one square inch. Okay, and so this is a pretty standard process that we did earlier in the semester, right? But, but here's the thing. We always picked an area that was close to this number, but it usually ended up going over a little bit, right? So every single beam design that we do, we end up providing a little bit more steel than we actually need, just because there's only so many ways that you can combine bars. There's only so many permutations of uh, multiples of number fives and number sixes and number sevens and so on and so forth. So one of the things that we can do for a development length is we can take this development length and we can reduce it by doing the, the, the following. We can say whatever value we compute here, and we can essentially multiply it by the ratio of how much we need versus how much we provide. Okay? And so the idea is, you know, we needed 3.7, but we provided more, so we can cut our development length down a little bit because we've got more steel than we need. Okay? So the idea is if we, if you want a simple way of thinking about it, if we provided, if this is how much steel we needed and we put double that much steel in the beam, we'd only need half the development length. Does that make sense? So we didn't use that last time, but we're definitely going to use it today. Okay. Sound good? Now this is the example we did last time. Uh, we de uh, determined the development length and we did it twice. So we did it once for a KTR value of zero and once for a computed KTR value. In practice, you, you just compute everything, but I wanted to sort of ease you into it a bit. So we said, okay, let's do one with KTR as zero so we can go through this process, and then one with KTR that's computed. Now, the difference between the two, what did we get? It was something like 55 inches for KTR as zero, and what was the other one? 44. So simply by just accounting for the transverse reinforcement that's there, we were able to reduce the development length down 20-some percent. That's quite a bit, just by doing some extra math. So don't, be, don't shy away from the math when you're in practice. Like, I know there's, a, there's something to be said about keeping it simple, but calculating a KTR value, reduce your development length 20 percent, do it. It's pretty simple. So, okay. This was the example we did last time. This is the example that we're doing this time. Now, um, this is a little bit, it looks very similar, but there's a lot more going on with this uh, than you would think. We have a different bar size. We've got some more data. We've got a different uh, uh, concrete. We've got a different bar location. Uh, we've, got, we've got quite a bit going on with this problem. So I'm going to take it slowly and just make sure that, that everybody's aware of what's going on. We've been provided a lot more info and a different cross-section, so let's see if we can figure some stuff out. Okay. So... You all have this, ooh, that is big. You all have this uh, in your notes, so there's nothing here that you all don't have available. Okay, 
me move all this. Okay, so we're going to do our development length problem uh, twice, just like last time. So we're going to do it once for KTR is zero and once for KTR is computed. And that's really just, at this point, like you, know, you understand the difference between KTR is zero and KTR is computed. That's just to get you a little bit more familiar with this equation. It looks nasty, but it's, it's really, uh, really simple. Okay. So let's see if, let's take the development length equation. Let's see if we can just start checking off every one of these parameters that we need. So do we have Fy and Fc prime for this problem? Okay, and so Fy is what? 60 what? ASI. And we have Fc prime is what? 3.5 KSI. Now, what's going on with uh, lambda? What was the deal with this problem? Lightweight, and so that means the lambda is what? So think about what that's going to do to the development length. Let's just think theoretically. Is that going to make the development length longer or shorter, the fact that we're using lightweight concrete? Well, think, think, about, think about what it, now let's look at it mathematically. Okay, so here's the expression. So here's lambda. So if lambda is smaller than 1, what's that going to do to the development length? Increase it. Now, now let's think conceptually, does that make sense? If I'm using lightweight concrete versus normal weight concrete, I'm going to wager that that lightweight concrete isn't going to provide as strong a grip. So I'm going to have to up my development length a good bit. And that's what this is doing, right? By putting lambda in the denominator, that's, that's going to cause my development length to go up. Yes, sir. Because, okay, that's a great question, okay? And the reason is, so the question was why is development length independent of the load? The reason why is because what we're doing is we're computing what is the development, what is the length required so that the bar can hit FY. Now, if we yank on that beam, if we yank on that beam and we exceed, you know, FY, then okay, add more bars. But we want to make sure that when we're performing, you know, ASFYD minus A over 2, that that analysis is appropriate. And so it's only going to be appropriate if the bar can actually hit FY. And so we don't know that until we know that it's met its development length. Now, again, but to, to be crystal clear, I'm not saying that the load isn't important. It, it very well is. But you just have to tack that other part onto it. Does that make sense? Is everybody else okay with that? This is good stuff. Okay. All right, is everybody clear that lightweight concrete is going to cause your development length to go up? Okay, all right. Now let's, uh, let's go into these further parameters. So now we've got our three psi values. So we've got psi t, psi e, and psi s. Okay, so let's take psi t first. What is psi t going to be for this beam? Remember, psi t is our top bar location factor. Remember, we're determining development length for these. Is it going to be 1 or is it going to be larger than 1? It's going to be larger than 1, right? Because we have a top bar. What is that going to be? 1.3. And so the reason that we're doing that is because we're dealing with top bars. And I'll say... What's the, what's the big dimension that we're looking for when we're looking at top bars? 12 inches. That this dimension here, we're talking about that dimension right there. And is that dimension bigger than 12 inches? You bet. It's 22 something, right? Because it's 23 to the center of the bar, so it's, what, 22 and a half. So, yeah, just fine. Okay, psi E. What's psi E going to be for this problem? One, and why is that? It's uncoded. There you go. We're dealing with regular old uncoded bars, so no issue there. Now, right off to the side, this is that one check I need to do, psi t and psi e. If you multiply those two, 1.3 times 1 is going to be 1.3. 1.3 1 
Why did I do that? Has to be less than or equal to 1.7, so we're good there. So that's good. Okay. Last one is our bar size factor, and what's that going to be? One. And why is that? What's the bar size? It's greater than a number six. Exactly right. So this is 1.0 greater than number six. Okay. So let's start, let's keep chipping away. We have C sub B. All right, so let's see about C sub B. By the way, just a heads up, for you folks in steel design, we're gonna introduce, we're gonna introduce a term in steel design called C sub B, totally not even the same thing. It's completely different. I know, that it's one of those ways us structural engineers could just be jerks, just keep using the same symbol over and over again. It's like physicists, there's so many different uses for Vs, like volume, velocity, and then there's the Greek letter that looks just like it. Yeah. We just we just suck sometimes. Okay. Okay. So C sub B. How do we do that? Remember, we're looking at those three distances, right? So we've got this distance here. We're going to the center of the bar. We've got this distance here. And then we've got this distance here. So of those three, we take the smallest, right? So what is C sub B in that case? Two inches. Because over here on the left, that's three inches up. If that's 26 and this is 23, that makes that three. And then if this is four inches halfway over is two, take the smallest. Yes? OK. Um, can I erase this? Okay, so remember, if you have, and I'm just going to use some mass of concrete, and you have a bar that you're yanking on, you're pulling it like this, remember those cracks, they sort of starburst out like that, and they're going to go like this until you hit either one of three places, either right there, right there, or think, you got a bar over here, that you're yanking on as well, right? So both of these are going to sort of like expand out like that until you get halfway over. You see what I mean? So that's what I'm saying. Like when it comes to this distance, these cracks, think if it goes out like that, I'm either going to hit here, here, or I'm going to hit here where that one's going as well. Do you see what I mean? Because this one, this cracked region, is expanding as well. Does that make sense? So that, that C sub B value is just capturing that effect. Does that make sense? It's, it's defined from the center. That's a great question. I mean, the, the effect is kind of the same, but yeah, it's, it's defined from the center for simplicity. Everybody good? This is good stuff. Okay. Now we're going to take KTR to be zero, I'll say for now. One final question, what is D sub B? Yep, and what is that? We're looking at number eight bars. One, right? Take the number, divide it by eight, that's your diameter in inches. Okay, so I got one more check I'm gonna do over here on the side. Okay, so I'm gonna check C sub B plus KTR over D sub B. What does that come out to be? Two. It's two, right? Because two plus zero is two divided by one is one. So that's two. Why did I do that? There we go. And so there you go. So once you've got that, do I have everything over there? You tell me. Am I missing anything? Like that's all of them, right? So we can go ahead and just start plugging and chugging. So our development length. And so what do we have? We have three on the top. We have, what is that? FY. Now what am I going to put in for FY? Say it again. 60,000, right? Put in 60,000. P 
PSI. Why is that? Because we're going to have on the bottom 40 times lambda times the square root. And remember, whenever you have square root of FC prime, you put in PSI, you get out PSI. And so we have 1.3, 1, 1, and then the bar diameter is 1 inch. And then this is multiplied by 2.0. Okay, and so what does that give you? Gonna make you do a little bit of work today. That's good. That's this. This whole fraction. There's no. That's the, that's a good point. There's no point in redoing it because we already did it over there. You know what I mean? I'm all about being lazy when it comes to doing calcs. If we've already computed a value, just use it. Leads to less mistakes. That sounds a little more reasonable. Check your decimals. 65.9. I got a 65.9 and I do have a second. Okay. Inches, right? Because look, the PSIs cancel and there's nothing left but that right there. So it's in inches. Now, that's a long development length. Let's see if we can shorten it. First off, what other fact, I mean, besides the KTR, what other fact are we not using in this example? Okay, so, so what is the problem state? Let's, let's go back to the problem. So here's, here's the problem. And so determine the development length for the four uncoded number eights assuming. So we took the care of the un uncoded. We're going to do this here in a second. So took care of that, lightweight concrete. So we got that, FY. But this part right here, okay, this is what I was talking about before where we only needed 2.88, but how much did we provide? 3.14. So we put in more steel that we needed. So we can take that development and we can chop it down a bit. Okay. So let's let's see if we can let's see what happens there. So therefore, LD reduced is going to be what? We take the 65.9 inches. And we multiply it by 2.88 over 3.14. And so what does that come out to be? 60.5. Do I have a second on that? Okay. All right. 60.5. So we'll call this answer one. So I'm just going to put a little table here on the, on the whiteboard because I just want to show you what we're doing here. So what we're going to do is we're going to say case. We'll say KTR equals zero. Then we'll say KTR doesn't equal zero. Then we're going to say original. Then we're going to say reduced. And so this was 65.9. This was 60.5. Now I'm just curious, just for prediction's sake, of the four values that are going to go in this table, one, two, three, four, Which one's going to be the smallest? Four. So let's see if we're right. So what's the difference between uh, the top row and the bottom row? It's KTR. So let's see, let's see what KTR does. All right. So KTR doesn't equal zero. Now KTR is computed as what? Okay, 40 ATR over SN. 
So let's come up with values for each of these parameters. First off, what's n? And number of bars what? In a single layer, all the single layers, all the single layers. I know, I know, it's okay. I'm a sleep deprived dad, you're gonna get some dad jokes. All right, so n is four because there's four bars in a single layer, right? Okay, s, what is s? It's the spacing, right? It's the spacing of your stirrups along the beam, okay? So let's go back up to the beam. So it's four because we're looking at these number eights and there's one, two, three, four in a single layer. S is gonna be what? The spacing of your transverse reinforcement, which is eight inches. Okay, and so the only thing left to look at is your ATR. Your ATR is nothing more for a beam than your AV. So what's AV for this beam gonna be? Anybody remember how to do that? We got number three U-shaped stirrups. 0.22, because each number three is 0.11. And then when we samurai sword or lightsaber through the center, we cut through one, two, so multiply times two. Remember that? ATR is just your AV, just your area of A sub V. So if you cut a section, you know, samurai sword or lightsaber, you're cutting through two bars. Each bar has an area of 0.11, so that uh, A sub V is 0.22. Any transverse reinforcement, right? So, so if you're looking at bars, so if you're trying to determine the development length of bars going this way, transverse reinforcement is area normal to that. So if you want, if you math folks, you can think of, you can think of it like this. So if your reinforcement is a vector, your transverse reinforcement is in the plane normal to that vector. You like, you like that, the, the calc three initiation. But then I start talking about statics, right? Should I just put some I hat, J hat, K hat on there? All right, okay. So plug and chug, and we get 40 times 0 0.22 square inches over 8 inches times 4. What is that? Wait, wait what? say it again. 0 0.275 inches, right? KTR is in inches. So the next thing I'm going to compute is CB plus KTR over D sub B. And what does that equal? 2.275. What does that tell you? It's okay. Why? Because it's less than 2.5. So this is 2.275. This is unitless. That's less than 2.5. And that's okay. So what's LD? And, and I, do I need to write out the formula again, or can you all just, instead of putting zero here, put in 2.27, or put in 0 0.275 and replace? Fifty-seven point nine five. Do I have a second on that? So this is fifty-seven point. So if it's fifty-seven point nine five, let's just call it fifty-eight. And what is LD reduced? And so this was fifty-eight. And this is what? Fifty-three point two. Right. So. Do I have a second on that value? Okay, all right. So 53.2. Now we've pulled a few, you know, rabbits out of the hat in terms of taking, you know, this original, you know, keep it simple development length into something that's that's a little bit more usable, but it still doesn't change the fact that that is long. You know, if this beam was framing into a column 
that column would need to be 53 inches wide. Have you ever seen a column that's 53 inches wide? That's a big column. That's a, that's a, that's a hefty section, okay? Um, you're not going to see a column like that in the 3rd Avenue parking garage. You know, take, go down to the 3rd Avenue parking garage and take a guess at how wide the columns are going to be. And they're not, you know, 52 inches, you know. Uh, don't go out there with a tape measure. Police come out like, what are you doing measuring the... I'm not going to demolish the place or anything, are you? All right. I have a... a there's a story about that. Um, when I was in undergrad, we did... We had, I took structural analysis. We had a project. We had to pick a structure and go, like, do this analysis of it. And so we picked this parking garage, and we were out taking all these measurements. These folks come out and thought we were, like, going to tear the place down. They thought we were like part of a demo crew. Like one of us came out with a reflective vest because he had a DOH internship, so he just came straight off work. And they thought we were going to tear the place down. Like we're just doing a project. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, okay. So everybody, good on, on on this so far. Any questions? Okay. Now again, it doesn't change the fact this is some really long development length. And if you have a column that's only, I don't know. 24 inches wide or something like that, that's not acceptable. It's, it's just not. So we got to figure out a way of changing up that development length. And so just to make sure that everybody's clear on what we're talking about, uh, are you okay if I erase this? Okay. So again, and this, this example here is a perfect, you know, perfect example. You know, we have a cantilevered beam, right? And we have, what, four number eights going up top. So they're going to be going like this. And so we need to determine that development length. And what we're saying is that the absolute minimum development length we can calculate so far has been like 53 inches. Well, what if this column right here is only 36 inches wide? Well, what do you do, you know? You just make the column 53 inches wide. That's just, just, and, and again, it, I go back to my, my party. You know, if you had a dance floor up here and people having a party, that's a short party because that rebar is just going to rip out and that, that's going to kill some people. Well, you use the right word. We're not going to hook it out the backside. What we're going to do is that. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to bend the rebar inside the concrete. Let me go back to my tug of war uh, example. So let me turn this turn this down. I apologize. Okay, let's go back to the tug of war uh, example. Okay, he and I engaged in a tug of war, and I and I beat him horrendously. <laughs> sure, yeah, but <laughs> but here here's the thing. Let's say, let's say for the sake of discussion, that we both had the same length of rope, okay? In all honesty, he'd probably beat me, you know? But instead, let's change up the geometry a little bit, okay? Let's say that he's holding the rope like this, but what I've done is looped the rope around this one fist, and now I'm yanking like that. I've got a better grip on that rope than you do. I just do, okay? He's probably still going to win. I'm just, I know. I know I'm a physically intimidating guy, but I, I have to just defer. I'm kidding. But, but in all seriousness, by wrapping the rope around my hand, it changes the geometry. Like, have you ever seen like a, a really big tug of war competition? You, know, you got like five or six people on either end. Usually, the person on the back is the one that has the loop, right? So they're they're the ones that have a different grip on the rope than everybody else does. They are essentially playing a different game than everybody else is. It's the same thing with, with uh, the rebar. If I have a piece of rebar that's just perfectly straight, stuck in a mass of concrete, and I yank on it, really what's holding that rebar in is friction. And that's about it. You know, the, the friction that develops between the concrete and the contact with the ribs of, of the rebar. But if I've got that rebar bent, and I have this big mass of concrete, and I shove that bent rebar into the mass of concrete. Well, now things are different. It's not the same story, right? It's not as simple as just a, a straight bar. Now the geometry is different. Now the mechanics are different. Everything's different, 
okay? So what does that mean? Well, what it means is we have a different expression for development length. Here's our expression for the development length of hooks, okay? Now, as a note, just right off the bat, development length for hooks comes out smaller, okay? One of the ways that you can improve development length is by bending the bar, and as a result, your development length gets smaller. So much so that the codes put some limits on your development length. There, there are actually some limits on straight bar development length, but they don't tend to pop up as much, I would say. I don't care what this equation spits out. I don't care. This value is never to be taken smaller than 6 inches or 8 times the bar diameter. I don't care what it spits out, so just make sure that you're aware of that. Okay, now the development length uh, fact or equation is a function of a couple things. Most of them are familiar. Some of them are new, okay? So for instance, the bar coding factor, the epoxy factor, that's the same, okay? Even if you have a hook, if it's epoxy coated rebar, it's still a slippery hook. So it's still going to have that same effect, okay? But by bending the bars, we actually stop caring about whether or not they're top bars or bottom bars. So that top bar factor, that's gone. We don't care about um, the bar size. By bending the bars, it changes the geometry, and the bar size doesn't have as big of an effect. That's gone too. Now, we do have a couple new ones, a cover factor and a confinement factor. That's a new one. The cover factor is new, but they're, they're pretty simple. All right, so the cover factor. All right, let's, let's take this one step at a time. So the cover factor is typically one, okay? And, and I want to be clear on a lot of these factors. Typically, they're all one. They're usually not one when something's unique or something's weird. So let's take the cover factor. Uh, it's one for most cases. It's 0.7 whenever one of these, or whenever these two things happen. If you have number 11 hooks or smaller hooks, so if you have uh, bars that are number 11 or smaller that are bent. Um, if the side cover on the bar is greater than or equal to two and a half inches. So if you've got a lot of concrete on the outside, we can reduce our development length by 0.7. Uh, otherwise, it's going to stay 0.1. If we have 90 degree hooks and the cover behind the hook is greater than or equal to two inches, then we can take a uh, side to be 0.7. Other than that, size one for all other cases. Now, when I say 90 degree hooks, uh, something I did kind of gloss over a little bit, but I want to be clear, there are two ways that you can bend rebar standardly, if you will. There are two standard dimensions. There's a 90 degree hook and a 180 degree hook. A 90 degree hook, you have a 90 degree bend, and then that length extends 12 times the bar diameter. That is a standard detail for any reinforced concrete element. That's a 90 degree hook. The one below, that's a 180 degree hook. A 180 degree hook, you bend it 180 degrees, so you are you know, using a little bit more material inside that, uh, uh, inside that bin. And then this part that sticks out is either the what's ever bigger, two and a half inches or four times the bar diameter. Whichever one's larger, that's the part that sticks out. Those are the two standard hooks that we use uh, in ACI. This is the 90 degree, this is the 180 degree. So for your cover factor, if you're looking at 90 degree hooks, this is the, the, the limit that applies. If it's 180, you're only looking at this one. If it's 90, you're looking at, at, at either or. The confinement factor, the confinement factor, is it kind of serves the same purpose as this part right here, that, that denominator, because it's all about where the, or whether that transverse reinfer, uh, reinforcement serves to confine uh, that concrete core. Like I said, in most cases it's one, but if you've got a lot of stirrups in there, like the stirrup spacing is less than three bar diameters, or that last stirrup increment is less than two bar diameters, you can reduce that uh, development length even further. But you do have to have quite a few stirrups in there to make that work. So I have here an image on that one, because that one, I'll tell you, I, I, I say that, and sometimes the suit's like, I, I heard you, but I can't quite see it. I can't quite visualize it. So for that value to be uh, 0.8, you know, here's the hook that we're looking at. These values have to be less than three times the bar diameter, and this one here at the end has to be less than or equal to two times the bar diameter for this factor to be 0.8. Otherwise, uh, it's 0.1. So that's, uh, yeah, that's some pretty tight stirrup spacing. Yes, sir? Both. 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 
Yeah, so you, ha you have to essentially meet that image right there for you to be able to use 0.8. Otherwise, you gotta use one. So, uh, and it is a way of improving your development length by just throwing a whole lot of stirrups in there. I, it, it'll work, you know, but it just depends, yes. Mm -hmm. Whichever one uh, is, uh, whichever one's smaller. Or sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Whichever one's bigger, sorry, whichever one's bigger. Because if you have like number three bars, you're going to use six inches. I'm sorry, so whichever one's bigger. Sorry about that, I confused. No, it's whichever one's bigger. So I think that's a typo. So it's smaller than six inches or eight bar diameter, I think that's a typo. I will check. Whoops. So what is that? Uh, what am I at now? Two points, two point three, right? No, no, it's two point three. It's two point three. All right. One, one final thing. And, and look, we're sort of. Let me see what time it is. I think we're sort of running short on time. We're not going to be able to get an example in on hooks today. But um, I've got two example, or I've got uh, I've got this example, but I'm going to do it two different ways because I'm going to do it assuming straight bars and then bars assuming a, a 90 degree hook. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this example and we're going to say, okay, how does bending it help the development length? And I'm telling you, you are going to be shocked at how the development length drops. I to give you an example, I don't remember the specific numbers. But if uh, it's something along the lines of the development length, assuming straight bars, is something in the 60-inch frame so, you know, range, but with hooks, it drops down to like 30 inches. And that's with no transverse reinforcement or cover or anything like that. So it's, it's a very significant uh, 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 and substantial change. Okay. Any questions? You first. And you. Yes, yes, so, so what we're talking about, I'll try and add some scale to it. So that's the bar with some depth. I'm talking about that to that. This, this, this distance, this distance here, if it's a 90 degree hook, is 12 bar diameters. So that depends on the bar size. Like if it was a number eight bar, that would be 12 inches. But if it's a number three bar, that's only going to be like three inches. Or, yes, yes. All right, wait, 12 times 36 divided by eight. 36 divided by eight is four and a half. So four and a half inches if it's number three. Yes. That's a good question, and unfortunately, I don't have one good answer for you. And the reason why is because really sort of every situation is different. It depends on the geometry of your structure. Are you looking at beams? Are you looking at slabs? Are you looking at columns? How much room do you have? How much room do you have with other reinforcement uh, being provided? Because, see, you, you got to keep in mind, it's, it's not as simple as just this is the only bar you're dealing with. Keep in mind, there's stirrups going this way. You've got the column reinforcement. You've got the transverse reinforcement for the column. You've got all the reinforcement for this joints. I mean, there's rebar going all over the place. So it, I, I don't have one good answer for you. The way that, that I approach it is this. I'm not giving you one good answer. Instead, I'm giving you a toolbox of potential answers. And so each project is going to be different. I, what I, if you want a general answer, I'd say this. I think I'm going to have different answers if I'm looking at, let's say, slabs versus if I'm looking at, let's say, beams or columns. Like if I was looking at a slab and I had a big issue with development length, I'd probably use something like a 180 degree hook and just call it, you know. Whereas if I'm looking at beams and columns, I'd have to think about that for a bit. And it depends on the case. So. It's also going to depend on whether or not I'm looking at a building or a bridge because it's the, with bridges you have a little bit more flexibility to do what you want with. Usually with buildings, particularly in areas where you've got seismicity, it's kind of tough. So. Yeah, 
they're pretty common. They are pretty common. Um, I don't want to say preferred because it just depends. So, but they are common. I, I mean, I wouldn't be talking about it if, if they weren't. So, a any other questions? Yes, we got. One, and I think we probably got to call because we're running out of time. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Our final topic in this class is columns and beam columns. What is a beam column? It's a column that's being bent. So we, we do both. Like a, a beam column sees axial load and bending. And so there's a lot of interaction that we got to do there. And that we will handle it, but that's, that's later. So All right, I think we're running short of time. I think we got to call it, everybody. Um, like I said, I'm not going to be here on Wednesday, um, but I'll be in touch with email and whatnot, and the homework should activate on Wednesday as well. So that's all I have, everybody. We will see you, uh, well, if you're in steel, we'll see you in about 10 minutes. So.